It's been one year since I started this channel and in that time there have been some historic tennis moments. Here are my five top runs of the past 12 months. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the tennis vlog. Remember to hit subscribe if you haven't already done so. So March the 4th marks a year since I uploaded the first video onto this channel. I thought to celebrate 12 months of the channel, I would list the five runs in ATP and WTA tennis that stood out most to me over the past year. So that's from March last year to March this year. This is just what personally jumps out at me if I were just to be sat here casually thinking about it. I know other people will have their own opinion so when you've watched the video, leave a comment and let me know your top five runs of the past 12 months and give me a bit of an idea as to why you've chosen them. I am only allowed to feature each player once in this list, so no repeat appearances. Otherwise, a couple of names might have consumed the list of five players all by themselves. So I'm going to jump right in with my number five, which is Sloane Stevens' run to the 2017 US Open title just six weeks after being ranked world number 956. Now, for those who don't know much about America's Sloane Stevens, aged 24, she was not ranked that low because that represented the standard of her play. Stevens had been out with injury for 11 months, injury that had required surgery. She was still in a boot as recently as April 2017. She had gone deep at Grand Slams before. She went to the semi-finals of the Australian Open in 2013, which was her breakout year, and she went deep at several majors after that. But despite her talent and despite the hype that had been around her for years, I don't think anyone saw her coming back from a crazy long injury to win her first Grand Slam title. Stevens' first tournament back in 2017 was Wimbledon, where she lost straightforwardly to Alison Risk in the first round. But when the tour transitioned to hard courts, she seemed to come alive, and she made back-to-back -back premier semi-finals at big events in Canada and Cincinnati or Cincinnati, and then obviously went straight on to win the US Open for her maiden Grand Slam title. If you look at the list of opponents she beat, you can see that there is a notable name in every single round, and her last two wins were extremely impressive. She was two points from losing to Venus Williams before winning that semi-final encounter, and she thrashed Madison Keys in her maiden Grand Slam final to take home the trophy, and a whopping amount of cash. The reason I haven't put Sloane higher in my list is because I am very much aware of how she dropped off after the US Open, which I predicted her to do so because that win had come out of nowhere so quickly. However, nothing can take away from how brilliant it was, 100% one of the best tennis stories of the year. I didn't really know which way around to put the next two players, but I'm going to go in with Caroline Wozniacki at number four for her back-to-back -back WTA finals and Australian Open victories. Each of these titles was her best career trophy at the time that she won it. Wozniacki had been world number one several years ago for the first time at the age of 20, so she's known the heights of the tour, but she had never won a Grand Slam title, and as the years slipped on and more young players and fresher players were winning major trophies, it began to look as though maybe she would never actually win one. But as a result of finally winning one, she also reclaimed the world number one ranking, and while I never write people off, I am not going to pretend I had Wozniacki returning to world number one, but you really have to hand it to her. There were several big names off the WTA tour over the past 12 months, but she was one of the players who stepped up to take advantage. While she didn't win the WTA finals with a clean five-love record, she came very close to doing so, knocking off Alina Zvitolina, Simona Halep, Karolina Pliskova, and Venus Williams in the final. At what seems to be a later stage in her career, Wozniacki could have let this big title satisfy her, but the impressive thing is that she did not. Even after splitting with her coach Sasha Bajin, who did great work with Wozniacki throughout last year and really helped her to get to that big title, she didn't let that throw her rhythm, and she didn't let the off-season throw her rhythm either. The first tournament of her 2018 season, she reached the final, and then in Melbourne she went all the way. Honestly, one of the lesser impressive lists of victims on the road to a Grand Slam trophy, definitely in recent times. However, the fact is that Wozniacki did it, she got that title that she'd been missing for so long, after so many years of being called a slamless world number one, which was quite true, which won't be the case anymore if she gets back to that ranking, which she claimed after Melbourne. So a truly great run for Wozniacki, demonstrating some of the consistency that the WTA has been lacking in recent years. And so we move 
move on to my third best run of the year and the last one featuring a WTA player, spoilers. This one is world number 47, Yelena Rostopenko's run to the French Open trophy, a complete and utter shock to the nations. Some of you might be wondering why I put Ostapenko ahead of Wozniacki and Stevens, but I still think that what Ostapenko did was one of the most incredible things tennis saw last season. It has been years since tennis saw a teenage Grand Slam champion just because the tours have got so much more physical, players are peaking around the age of 30, but Ostapenko was 19 years old for the majority of that French Open fortnight, turning 20 towards the end of the event. And what stays with me most about her run nine months on is not the list of players that she beat, not the fact that she won a maiden Grand Slam trophy without ever having won a WTA title before, but the fact that she had such an incredible attitude. She was not scared, she was not intimidated, she went out there to win and she didn't care what the stage was, she didn't care what the cost was, she was going out there with this laser focus. And she did beat a really decent list of players. She had Monica Puig in round two, who'd won the Olympic gold medal and had won her only previous WTA title on the surface of clay. And then in those final four matches, she beat four seeded players, all in three sets. And on three of those occasions, she was coming from a set down, including in the final where she was a set and a break down to number three seed Simona Halep. When she came out for the final, she absolutely went for it in a manner that I have never seen anyone go for their shots in their maiden Grand Slam final. She just acted as if it was another match, and it is that attitude that is going to really take her places in the future. But another great thing about this triumph for Ostapenko is that she didn't just fade away afterwards. Nine months later, she is still ranked inside the top 10, and straight afterwards at Wimbledon, she made the quarterfinals, only losing there to Venus Williams, who was the eventual runner-up and is a five-time Wimbledon champion. So, of the four Grand Slams we saw last season on the women's tour, Yelena Rostopenko's remains the most impressive victory for me. Moving on to some ATP players now, and I bet you can't guess who they are. In at number two in my best runs of the past 12 months is Rafael Nadal's 10th French Open title. With Roger Federer skipping the clay court season and Nadal having won three of the four clay court tournaments he entered ahead of the French Open, he had to deal with being the red-hot favourite despite not having won the event since 2014. He had been brilliant on hard courts and clay courts up to that point of the season, but that tournament was really going to test his mentality and how he was going going to deal with being the man with all the pressure on his shoulders and, as we saw, he dealt with it phenomenally, as he had done so many times previously at Roland Garros. He absolutely demolished his opponents, zero sets dropped, kind of like a fist pump, and he never dropped more than four games in a set, and whoever he faced you cannot argue with that. And having said that, he did face some quality players, he had Stan Favrinka in the final, who obviously had won the event in 2015. You may not remember, but Dominic Thiem had been in great form during the clay court season and actually beat Nadal ahead of the French Open, but he could not hold a candle to him in the semi-finals. What more can you say? He is an all-time great, an absolute legend, and it was just a pure display of brilliance from Nadal throughout the whole two weeks in Paris. And finally, my top run of the last 12 months is Roger Federer's run to the Australian Open title this season and his ensuing run to the world number one ranking. 18 months ago, Roger Federer was a 17-time major champion who had not won a Grand Slam title in four years. He was just coming back from six months away from the tour due to injury, during and before which critics had told him to retire and be done. 18 months later, he is back to world number one and he is a 20-time Grand Slam champion, the most slams that have been won by a male player in the history of tennis. Hashtag life lessons, hashtag don't write people off, especially not legends. And on that note, let's take a moment to think of Novak Djokovic and Andy Murray, who are both struggling with injuries right now. If we have learnt anything from Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal, it should be that you should not write players off until they write themselves off, and I don't see Djokovic or Murray writing themselves off, so whether they're injured or not, give it time. You might wonder why I picked Federer's 2018 Australian Open title over his Wimbledon title last year, which got him to eight Wimbledon trophies, which is a record. For me, Federer winning the Australian Open was almost a foregone conclusion once Rafael Nadal had pulled out of the event, and I think for many others as well. Obviously, there's always the possibility of an upset, as we saw in the final, when Marin Cilic took Federer to five sets, in a great clash. Honestly, I don't think Federer ever really peaked during the tournament. I think that the fact that he hadn't dropped a set on the way to the final kind of hid the fact that he had been 
sailing pretty close to the wind at times. Obviously 2017, which doesn't tie into our 12 month period, was more impressive because he had an absolutely killer draw, his backhand was suddenly a solid and devastating weapon, and he was flying on the wings of unexpected success. And true, this year his path to the trophy was hardly the most challenging, he only faced one top 10 player. But 20 major titles speak for themselves. And for Federer, at this stage of his career, it could be harder to face the prospect of seven matches that he should definitely win than and seven matches where tough competitors are in the mix. The pressure was on, Federer handled it, and winning the first major of the year was massive after the off-season, which had the potential to jolt Federer's rhythm. He then went to Rotterdam specifically to try and gain the world number one ranking, which he did, and then thrashed Grigor Dimitrov in the final. Whoever he's facing, this just goes to show that Federer's game is in the right place, his head is in the right place, and as far as I'm concerned, it's 20 Grand Slams and counting. So that is it, my five top runs of the past 12 months. What were yours? Let me know in the comments section. I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has subscribed to and supported the channel over the past 12 months. If this is your first time watching a video then don't forget to subscribe. I will have several preview and predictions videos coming for Indian Wells next week, the fifth Grand Slam which is already well underway. Also I am trying to upload interview features with tennis players and people within the tennis world and the tennis circuit on a weekly basis on my website, The Tennis Journal. Link in the description, make sure to check that out. Thank you for watching, thank you for following the tennis with me for the past year, I hope you will continue to do so for the next 12 months, and I will see you at the next video.